Think history's villains are all mustache-twirling men? Think again. Welcome to the dark side of the history books, where women aren't just making pies, they're making trouble. From bloodthirsty countesses to ruthless queens, these ladies weren't just breaking hearts. They were breaking, well, let's just say a lot more. So, buckle up as we dive into the tales of the most evil women in history. Disclaimer. You might never look at your history teacher the same way again. Elizabeth Bathory, the Blood Countess. In the Hall of Historical Horror, Elizabeth Bathory takes a bloody bow. This 16th century Hungarian countess wasn't just nobility, she was notoriety personified. With a rap sheet rumored to include bathing in the blood of virgins, she's like the original villainess of vampire lore, minus the sparkling skin. Born into one of the most powerful Protestant families in Hungary, Elizabeth had a taste for the finer things in life, and allegedly, a taste for blood. It's like she saw a spa day and thought, needs more gore. Her story takes a dark turn with accusations of torturing and killing young girls. The number varies from a ghastly 80 to a nightmarish 650. It's like she was trying to set some kind of twisted high score. The methods? They ranged from burning to biting to, well, let's just say it wasn't pretty. Legend has it that Elizabeth's quest for eternal youth led her to bathe in the blood of virgins. It's like a really extreme anti-aging cream. The idea was that the blood would keep her looking young and beautiful. It's like Botox, but with a body count. The end came for Elizabeth when King Matthias II decided that enough was enough. She was arrested and eventually confined to a room in her own castle where she lived out her days. It's like being grounded, but with more historical significance. The legacy of Elizabeth Bathory is shrouded in myth, legend, and a whole lot of blood. Was she a sadistic murderer, a victim of a political conspiracy, or just a really misunderstood skincare enthusiast? The truth is as murky as a bathtub after a bloodbath. Catherine de' Medici, the Machiavellian queen mother. Now let's stir the pot with Catherine de' Medici the Italian-born Queen of France, who cooked up more schemes than a season of Game of Thrones. Known for her political cunning, Catherine was like the chess grandmaster of royal intrigue, if the chess pieces were actual people and the game board was France. Catherine wasn't always the power behind the throne. She started as an orphaned Italian noblewoman, married off to Henry II of France. It's like being the new kid in school, but the school is a royal court, and the other kids are nobles vying for power. Once in France, Catherine's life was more soap opera than fairy tale. Her husband was besotted with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers, who was like the high school queen bee but with more royal jewels. Catherine, however, bided her time because revenge is a dish best served cold, and Catherine was a master chef in the kitchen of vengeance. When Henry II died, thanks to a jousting accident because sports were more hardcore back then, Catherine's time to shine arrived. She became the queen mother and regent, pulling the strings of power like a puppeteer at a royal marionette show. But Catherine's most infamous moment came with the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572. Tensions between Catholics and Protestants were like a pot about to boil over, and Catherine turned up the heat. The massacre saw thousands of Protestants, or Huguenots, killed, and it said Catherine played a key role in its orchestration. It's like planning a dinner party, but instead of food, you serve up a helping of religious persecution. Catherine's reign was marked by constant religious wars and power struggles. She navigated through them with the grace of a ballerina and the ruthlessness of a shark. It's like she was playing political dodgeball and she was always the last one standing. So when you're dealing with family drama, just be thankful you're not in a 16th century royal court. At least your family gatherings don't involve plotting a massacre, hopefully. Ilse Koch, the Beast of Buchenwald. Let's march into the grim story of Ilse Koch, known as the Beast of Buchenwald, who turned cruelty into a hobby at one of Nazi Germany's most notorious concentration camps. If there was a contest for the worst camp guard, Ilse would have won a gold medal and then probably made a lampshade out of it. Ilse, the wife of Karl Otto Koch, the commandant of Buchenwald, wasn't just a bystander in the horrors of the Holocaust, she was an enthusiastic participant. It's like she saw evil and said, hold my beer. Her infamy stemmed from her alleged collection of lampshades, book covers, and gloves made from the skin of murdered inmates. It's like she was trying to start the world's most horrifying Etsy shop. 
These items were said to be crafted from prisoners with distinctive tattoos, a hobby that's not just macabre, but also a serious violation of every crafting rule ever. Ilsa's cruelty wasn't limited to her gruesome collection. She was known for her arbitrary and sadistic abuse of prisoners. It's like she treated the camp as her personal playground, if playgrounds were designed by a horror movie director. After the war, Ilsa's reign of terror came to an end. She was tried for her crimes, although the evidence of her skin collection was less clear-cut than the legends suggest. It's like trying to solve a crime where the evidence is as twisted as the criminal. Ilsa Koch's story is a chilling reminder of the depths of human cruelty. It's the kind of tale that makes you lose a little faith in humanity, then lock your doors and maybe cuddle a puppy for comfort. The next time you think your neighbor is mean for not returning your lawnmower, just remember it could be worse. You could be living next to Ilsa Koch. Ranavalona Freya, the Mad Queen of Madagascar. Next up, let's take a tropical trip to Madagascar. Not for the lemurs, but for Ranavalona Freyims, the queen who could give any villain a run for their money. Her reign was less about island paradise and more island of nightmares. If there was a competition for tyrannical rulers, Ranavalona would be waving from the winner's podium. Ranavalona I ascended to the throne in 1828 and quickly turned from a seemingly benign ruler into the Mad Queen of Madagascar. It's like she decided that being nice was overrated and opted for the fear and terror approach instead. Her methods of maintaining power were, let's say, creative. She used a traditional trial by ordeal called the Tangina to root out enemies and dissenters. This involved ingesting poison and a few chicken skin pieces. If you vomited up all the skin pieces, congratulations, you were innocent. If not, well, it was nice knowing you. It's like playing Russian roulette, but with poison and poultry. Ranavalona's isolationist policies turned Madagascar into a no-entry zone. She cut off ties with Europeans, seeing them as a threat to her power. It's like she put up a no trespassing sign, but on a national scale. Her reign was marked by numerous alleged atrocities, from mass labor projects that resulted in thousands of deaths to the persecution of Christians. It's like she saw her kingdom as a chessboard, and she wasn't afraid to knock over a few pawns. Under her rule, Madagascar's population plummeted, and the kingdom became increasingly isolated. It's like throwing a party and then making sure no one has fun, including yourself. Ranavalona's rule lasted 33 years, and by the time she passed away, Madagascar was a drastically changed place. It's like she took the island on a roller coaster ride, but forgot to put on the safety harnesses. If you're planning a vacation and think about an island getaway, just remember Ranavalona I. Sometimes the most beautiful places have the most tumultuous histories. Irma Gracie, the hyena of Auschwitz. Let's step into the grim shadows of World War II with Irma Gris, a name that sends shivers down the spine of history. Known as the hyena of Auschwitz, she wasn't just working at the concentration camp, she was making a horrific name for herself. If there was a most likely to be villainous award in the Nazi camp yearbook, Irma would have won it hands down. Irma Gracie was one of the few female guards in the Nazi concentration camps, and she quickly stood out, not for her compassion, but for her cruelty. It's like she looked at the job description and thought, ah, a chance to be my worst self. Her reign of terror at Auschwitz and later Bergen-Belsen was marked by sadistic abuse and unspeakable acts. She had a penchant for wearing heavy boots and carrying a whip, like a nightmarish version of a dominatrix. It's like she was auditioning for a role in a horror movie, and she nailed it. Irma's cruelty wasn't just physical. She was known for her psychological torment of prisoners. She would often select inmates for the gas chambers, adding a personal touch of terror. It's like she was trying to add a personal worst category to the history books. But every villain's story has an end, and Irma's came with the liberation of the camps. She was captured, tried, and eventually executed for her crimes. It's like the final act of a play where the villain gets their comeuppance, except it's real, and you can't help but think, good riddance. Irma Grisi's story is a chilling reminder of the depths of human depravity. It's the kind of tale that makes you wonder about the monsters that can lurk in human form. So next time you're watching a scary movie and think the villain is too over the top, just remember Irma Grisi. Sometimes, reality is far more terrifying than fiction. Mary I of England, Bloody Mary. Now, let's pour a glass of history with Mary I of England, better known as Bloody Mary. 
And no, we're not talking about the cocktail, though her reign might drive you to drink. Mary's story is like a Shakespearean tragedy. If Shakespeare was into religious persecution and burning people at the stake, Mary, the first queen to rule England in her own right, had a tough start. Her dad, Henry VIII, was more into wives and beheadings than Father of the Year awards. When Mary ascended the throne, she had big plans, like bringing Catholicism back to England. It's like going to a party that's moved on from your favorite music, but you insist on changing the playlist anyway. Her method of re-Catholicizing England? The good old-fashioned way, fear and flames. Under her rule, hundreds of Protestant dissenters were burned at the stake. It's like she thought the best way to win hearts and minds was through a barbecue of terror. Mary's zeal for burning Protestants earned her the nickname Bloody Mary, which is a bit of a PR nightmare. It's like getting a nickname in high school that you really, really don't want, but it sticks anyway. But Mary's reign wasn't all fire and brimstone. She also re-established the navy and reformed the currency. It's like she was trying to balance out the whole burning people alive thing with some positive achievements. In the end, Mary's reign lasted just five years. She passed away at the age of 42, possibly from ovarian cysts or uterine cancer. It's like the universe said, okay, you've had your fun with the fire, time to wrap it up. So next time you're sipping a Bloody Mary, just remember its namesake. She might not have invented the drink, but she certainly left a mark on history and not the kind you want to toast to. Isabella of Castile, the queen of the Spanish Inquisition. Let's take a historical journey to Spain, where Isabella of Castile reigned not just with a scepter, but with an iron fist wrapped in religious zeal. If there was a most intense monarch award in the Middle Ages, Isabella would be giving her acceptance speech and thanking the Spanish Inquisition. Isabella, along with her husband Ferdinand, was the powerhouse behind the unification of Spain. But she didn't just stop at political unity, she aimed for religious uniformity too. It's like she looked at her kingdom and thought, one nation under one faith or else. Enter the Spanish Inquisition, one of history's most infamous examples of religious persecution. It was like a really extreme vetting process, but instead of a job interview, you got the rack or the stake. The Inquisition targeted Jews, Muslims, and anyone else who didn't fit Isabella's Catholic mold. But Isabella wasn't just about the doom and gloom, she was also the patron of Christopher Columbus. It's like she was scrolling through her 15th century version of Kickstarter and thought, this guy wants to sail where? Sure, here's some ships, go find me a shortcut to India. Under Isabella's rule, thousands were forced to convert or flee, and the Inquisition became a tool of terror. It's like she was running a convert or leave campaign, with an emphasis on the or else, Isabella's policies led to the expulsion of Jews from Spain in 1492, a move that reshaped the cultural and religious landscape of the nation. It's like she decided to throw a going-away party, but the guests didn't have a choice about leaving. Myra Hindley, the Moor's murderer. Let's venture into the chilling tale of Myra Hindley, one half of the infamous Moor's murderers. If there was a Most Wicked Couple Award in Britain, Myra and her partner Ian Brady would have won it by a sinister landslide. Their story is like a crime drama, but one where you really wish the villains were just fictional characters. Myra Hindley, with her peroxide blonde hair and cold demeanor, became one of Britain's most notorious female criminals in the 1960s. She and Ian Brady embarked on a horrifying killing spree, targeting children. It's like they saw normal couple activities and thought, let's do something different, something diabolical. Their modus operandi was as chilling as it was straightforward. They would lure children and teenagers to the Moors outside Manchester, where the unimaginable would happen. The Moors murders were not just crimes, they were the stuff of nightmares, the kind that make you double check your locks at night. But Myra wasn't just an accomplice, she was an active participant. This wasn't a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time, it was being the wrong person in the worst way possible. She was the bait that lured the victims, a wolf in sheep's clothing, if the sheep were particularly malevolent. The duo's reign of terror came to an end when David Smith, Hindley's brother-in-law, witnessed Brady killing a 17-year-old boy and went to the police. It's like he stumbled into the worst possible family secret and decided to blow the whistle. During their trial, the depth of their crimes was laid bare. Tape recordings of one of their victims, 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey, pleading for her life, 
were played in court. It was a moment that shook not just the courtroom, but the entire nation. It's like the mask of normalcy was ripped off, revealing the monsters beneath. Hindley and Brady were both convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment. Myra Hindley, once a seemingly ordinary typist, became a symbol of evil, her name synonymous with some of the most heinous crimes in British history. In prison, Hindley made multiple attempts to portray herself as a reformed character, claiming she was under Brady's influence. But the public and the families of the victims saw through it. It's like trying to put a band-aid on a gaping wound. Hindley died in 2002, after spending 36 years in prison. Her death brought an end to a dark chapter, but the shadow of her crimes still lingers. It's a reminder of the depths of depravity to which humans can sink. Jung Ching, the Dragon Lady of the Cultural Revolution. Now let's take a dramatic turn to China and spotlight Jung Ching, better known as the Dragon Lady of the Cultural Revolution. If there was an award for most dramatic political maneuvering, Jiang Qing would be giving her acceptance speech with a mix of revolutionary zeal and theatrical flair. Jiang Qing wasn't just the wife of Mao Zedong, the founding father of the People's Republic of China. She was a political powerhouse in her own right. Think of her as the ultimate behind-the-scenes player, except the stage was China, and the stakes were incredibly high. Before diving into politics, Jiang Qing had a stint as an actress. It's like she was rehearsing for the role of a lifetime, the leading lady in one of China's most turbulent periods. But instead of Oscars, her performance earned her a place in the annals of infamy. When Mao launched the Cultural Revolution in 1966, Jiang Qing saw her chance to take center stage. The Cultural Revolution was like a political earthquake, shaking up Chinese society to its core, and Jiang Qing was there, directing the tremors. She became a key member of the Gang of Four, a political faction known for its radical influence during the Cultural Revolution. The Gang of Four was like the mean girls of Chinese politics, if the mean girls were responsible for nationwide chaos and persecution. Zhang Qing's specialty? Propaganda and the arts. She wielded culture as a weapon, orchestrating a makeover of Chinese arts to align with communist ideology. It's like she was the editor-in-chief of a magazine, but the magazine was Chinese culture and the articles were about how great the Communist Party was. But Jiang Qing's influence wasn't just limited to the arts. She was instrumental in the political purges and persecutions that characterized the Cultural Revolution. It's like she was playing a game of political whack-a-mole, but the moles were actual people, and the consequences were deadly. Her methods were ruthless. She orchestrated public denunciations, where people were publicly humiliated and abused. It's like the worst kind of reality TV show, where the contestants are humiliated for their political beliefs. As the Cultural Revolution wound down, so did Jiang Qing's power. After Mao's death in 1976, she and the rest of the Gang of Four were arrested. It was like the season finale of a political drama, where the villains finally get their comeuppance. Jiang Qing's trial was a spectacle. She defiantly defended her actions, claiming loyalty to Mao's vision. It's like she was still playing the part of the revolutionary heroine, but the audience wasn't buying it anymore. In the end, Jiang Qing was convicted and sentenced to death, a sentence later commuted to life imprisonment. She remained a controversial figure, a symbol of the excesses and horrors of the Cultural Revolution. It's like she was a cautionary tale in the power of political fanaticism. Griselda Blanco, the godmother of cocaine. Now let's dive into the underworld of the drug trade with Griselda Blanco also known as the godmother of cocaine. If there was an award for most notorious female drug lord, Griselda would be accepting it with a cocaine-dusted bouquet in one hand and a gun in the other. Her life was like a crime movie script, except it was too wild for Hollywood to believe. Griselda's story begins in Cartagena, Colombia, where she was born into poverty. It's like she looked at her humble beginnings and thought, I'm going to rise to the top, and I'm going to do it with style, violence, and a whole lot of cocaine. She moved to the US in the 1970s and set up shop in Miami, turning the city into the epicenter of the cocaine trade. It's like she saw Miami's party scene and thought, you know what this needs? More drugs. Griselda wasn't just dealing in small quantities. We're talking tons of cocaine, shipped from Colombia to the US, making her one of the first to establish major drug trafficking routes. 
It's like she was a pioneer, but instead of the Oregon Trail, it was the cocaine trail. Her methods were as brutal as they were effective. Griselda was known for her ruthlessness and her fondness for murder. She allegedly masterminded over 200 killings. It's like she had a checklist for her enemies, and the only item on it was eliminate. One of her most infamous innovations was the motorcycle assassination, where gunmen on bikes would carry out hits in broad daylight. It's like she saw a drive-by and thought, but what if it was faster and with more horsepower? Griselda's personal life was as tumultuous as her criminal career. She married three times, and each of her husbands met violent ends. It's like she believed in, till death do us part, quite literally. But every crime story has an ending, and Griselda's came in 2012. After serving time in prison and then being deported to Colombia, she was assassinated in Medellin. It was a violent end to a violent life. It's like the final scene of a gangster movie, where the kingpin meets their inevitable fate. Griselda Blanco's legacy is a complex one. She was a trailblazer in a male-dominated world of crime, a self-made millionaire, and a cold-blooded murderer. Her life was a testament to the extremes of ambition, power, and the corrupting influence of the drug trade. So, next time you're watching a crime drama and think the female villain is too over the top, just remember Griselda Blanco. In the world of drug lords, she was as real and as ruthless as they come.